I am Tyrone Ross, host of the Human Advisor Podcast. Before we get started, I need you all to run to YouTube, smash that subscribe button, where you'll be able to see the full-length conversation with myself and Emlyn Miles Mattingly, the CEO and founder of Gen Next Wealth. This podcast, that conversation is all about humanizing the experience that advisors have in their practice and bringing that to you. When you'll see the conversation that Emlyn and I had, it's really about family. It's really about his clients. And he references his clients all being friends, all being family. That's what this is all about. You'll also see us walking and talking about a special and pivotal moment in my life as well as his, the year 2012, really pay attention for how that seminal moment in his life impacted his practice. Here are some highlights of that conversation. Enjoy. That's the atmosphere that we have. Everyone knows each other. When we talk about Gen Next Wealth, is Gen Next Wealth is helping minority families build generational wealth. So I need to know mom and dad. I need to know the kids that are my age. I need to know the grandkids. The money is all lined up there. Our sister pastor going through a divorce, then I get a DUI, and then I get into the industry. Sheesh. It was uh, it was it was a roller coaster ride, um, and it, it, it was it was tough, man. It right. was a tough time, but uh, we made it through and learned some life lessons. And and, 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 and let me ask that: like, what yeah. lessons do you take from that? Life lessons, right? Yeah. And then and, and even lessons that you bring, you know, bring to your your clients and or just to your practice in general and I, how you look at this business. I think about prior to all that stuff happening, I was very judgmental of people. Right. And so, you know, never doing anything wrong. Right. It was easy for me to call someone out on something, you know, about what they did wrong. Oh, you did that wrong. Oh, you did that wrong. You did that wrong. After all this stuff happened to me, I had didn't have a good leg to stand on. Right. And it was a really humbling experience. Right. And so approaching financial planning with humility has been. Yeah. Yeah. That's the whole practice. Yep. Right. Absolutely. When I first started as a manager in the bank, I started my career. I was staying in that hotel right there. Really? And I stayed in San Francisco for six months while I was doing my training. And here we are, you know, let's say 12 years later, right. filming this across the street. That's crazy. From where things started. So wow, that's kind of, you know. That's powerful. That's powerful. Clearly, we are in the social media age, the yeah. branding, right? Oh, we were just talking about King content. Yeah. Um, Mr. Castelli. Um, and you, before that, right, just talking about referrals. So how do you, how do you, you know, you market leverage, you know, leverage your social media? Is it more traditional media? Like, how, how do you go about creating a name for, for Gen X? Mostly social media. Uh, primarily just showing me, like just right. being. The just, podcast. Yeah, right. the, the podcast, podcast. Definitely, definitely the podcast. Uh, but that just started, you know, that's only been two months going. So I know it seems like it's been long, but it's only yeah. been two months. Wow. Um, so, you know, primarily it's been just telling my story uh, at all all times on all social media. So right. whether it's, you know, a picture of me, whether it's where I'm going to be working at, whether it's about um, the family or whether it's about whatever I'm doing. Just right. just people just want to know, you know, people. I had someone come up to me the other day, uh, a client, and she was like, before she came in, she looked me up on social media. And she said, it was between you and another advisor. And when I looked at your social media, she said, I seen pictures of you. I seen pictures of your family. I could see your business. Wow. She said, before I came in, I felt like I knew you. And so I decided to go with you over him because all he did is talk about money. And I didn't even hear you talk about that. Wow. See, that, that's why that, that branding is important. And, that, and, and it's funny, people pick and choose, you know, the platforms that they use. but. And people, I was like, oh, well, what about, I was like, my, my clients follow me on every platform. Like they, you know, you get clients from Twitter, yeah, but, and then they're on there. So that, that's a really, that's a really interesting thing. Let me ask you this though, do you plan to do, you know, the, the speaking circuit has become a thing with financial advisors. I, I know, again, I've, I've done a lot of it, obviously, with a, with a specialization with crypto. Do you plan to do that more? I would love to. Or do you feel like that takes you away from the practice too much? Not necessarily, because um, I think it's a part of the practice, right? If I'm really trying to get out there and talk to minorities, as we get more minority advisors in there and advisors that aren't minorities that are dealing with minorities, I think that I, that's a place where I can talk. That's a place that I can, uh, uh, a topic that I can talk to, one, because I am one and those right, are where right. my clients are at. And, you know, just talking about personal development, growth, just different things that I think uh, people need to hear. Right. So, yeah. yeah. 
Ooh. Well, that's that's um, again, I, I feel I, you know, I, I ran about it all the time, how I feel like our business is right for disruption. We are right in the bullseye. It's social media, it's voice, it's blockchain, it's all of these different things. Um, but again, one of the things that are consistent and the, the advisors that are gonna be around are the ones who have relationships with their clients, who build that connection. Now, the, I, I also believe those tools are gonna allow us to build a bigger connection, right? If we, if we, leverage, if we leverage them properly. So it's good to know that we're forward thinking and again, reaching the people that we want to reach and who we speak for i think it's you know on the second point of that that they do see you in front of a crowd right and as i said it is also important that they see the audience looks like us as well and that's the one thing that i that it continues to bug me when i look out to these audiences. i'm like well i'm up here they yeah. check the box yeah but now who <laughs> right? Yeah. So it's like, that. Well, I was like, you know, I, we got to start bringing more of us into these rooms when we do get those opportunities. It's crazy because I was, uh, when I go to, we talked about this in the room that day, in the hotel room, but when we go into a place, like, I'll go to the high school. You know, today we're dressed casual and we talked about this. But if I go to the high school, like, they're going to do mock interviews, I believe this week we're doing them at, excuse me, in, in Madeira. When I go there, I'm wearing a suit. Why? Because I'm probably the only black man that they're going to see in a suit. Yes. So they need to see me yep. like that. And so yep. I think when it comes to the kids uh, or, or young adults, like there was there was someone that told me this back to the to the church thing. I had a, a pastor tell me one time I was up I was at their church uh, in Sacramento and I went up there and he had me say a few words and he pulled me to the side afterwards and he said, Emlyn, he said, you know what? He said, my he said, do you see the way my young black men look at you? I don't see anything. He said, the way they look at you, they'll never look at me like that. Right. And this is why we need more of you. Yep. Because you can reach them like I can't reach them. They look at me and say, okay, well, this, that, and the other thing. And this is all at the age of, you know, I was like 25, 26. I really didn't understand what he was saying. Yeah. Now I get it. Right. Right. And especially being being a father. Yeah, right? absolutely. That had, like you're looking, you know, you, you're speaking to a generation of youth. Right? You want your kids to have those examples. And I look at it all the time. It's like I ask these, you know, young black boys all the time, like, do you know what I do? Mm -hmm. They have no idea. They yeah. don't know what a financial advisor is. They don't know what any of that is. So it's powerful that we continue to create that imagery. And as a black man, you are challenged with that. Like when I go on Bloomberg, my client's like, oh, just wear jeans and a T-shirt. I'm like, I can't do that. Yeah. I don't have that luxury. No. You know, so. Powerful stuff, powerful stuff. That's Elgin Miles right there, my grandfather. He said, uh, if you look like someone, you act like someone, people will treat you like someone. 100%. So 100%. I just try that. All right, welcome back to another edition of the Human Advisor Podcast. I am your host, Tyrone Ross, special guest in the building. Emlyn Miles Mattingly, brother, how are you? Doing great. Of Gen Next Wealth is here to spend some time with us. We're gonna kick it a little bit. Um, I just finished your podcast not too long ago, uh, so you returned it to favor. I appreciate that. Um, wow, I, I mean, so many ways we could take it. You know, from our, from our initial conversation when yeah. we met, right? Um, I'm sure the year uh, 2012 will come up at some point. Um, but, you know, again, man, I, I, I appreciate you coming. You know, you drove from Madeira, right, California, in, uh, you know, two hours or so here. So I appreciate the time. But let's just, you know, just start right with it. Tell us a little bit about you, about your practice, um, who you serve, why you serve them, and, and let's just chop it up, man. We jump right in then. Yeah. Uh, so where I, like, the practice started, I have a niche. I work with minority families. Okay. Uh, the way it all started was, it was accident. You know, I didn't pick the niche, the niche chose me. Right, right. So, I know, always say, <laughs> when you find a niche, it becomes a niche. Yeah, <laughs> right? So, so now I'm in my niche. But right. what, what happened was, uh, you know, started in banking, worked as a teller, uh, worked there for four years as a teller as I was going to school, and then from being a teller, I got into new accounts, and then I eventually became the branch manager. We always had financial advisors in the office. Right. And... They, you know, they showed up late, left early. Not, nothing like what I'm doing now, but right. they showed up late, left, you know, left early, right. drove the nicest car, had a nice suit. I was like, I want that. Mm -hmm. Didn't know what it was, but I just wanted to have a piece of that. Yeah. Uh, and so getting into, you know, first firm that I go off into was uh, Edward Jones, and I worked there for a little while. Uh, and then from Edward Jones, I went to another uh, insurance company and worked there for, you know, between those two places, a, a little over five years. 
And the reason why Gen Next Wealth was came about is because when I was sitting there meeting with clients, we were, you know, in the industry, the only way you make money is to deal with people that have money. Right, right. So I get into the industry so I can help people that look like me right. and other minorities. And and the only way I could be successful in this company was to not help those people because they mm. didn't have the money and the assets to, mm. to really um, make money for the company. And so what happened from there was I, I started asking my clients, I started noticing that uh, a lot of clients were coming to me from white advisors. They were leaving their white advisors and coming to, to, to invest with me right. or buy insurance for me and doing all these things. And, and I, I didn't really think anything of it mm -hmm. until, uh, you know, I, you know, I, I have you know, over a hundred clients and I'm looking at them and I right, <laughs> look right. at all the clients. I was like, wow, this is a minority book. Like everybody in the book, you know, looks like me or, or my wife. Or, and so I'm like, okay, well maybe I have something here. And right. so then, and your wife is, my wife's Mexican. Mexican. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so when that all happened, I was like, you know what? I think I can do this better because I was still getting the questions. I'd sell someone an insurance policy, you know, I'd get them some mutual funds and they'd still have questions about their company benefits. They still have questions about how to invest money in their 401k. Right. They still have questions about, you know, what do I do with this trust or having beneficiaries, their children as beneficiaries and just a lot of different financial questions that they weren't being answered mm -hmm. from the services that I was offering because the only way I was being paid was it's to sell true. a product. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, fast forward a couple of years and I start my own firm and it was, largely based on being able to help minority families. So let's talk about that, right? And you talk about starting your own firm, right? And, and, you, and starting your own firm as a black man, yeah. right? Like what, what were some of the challenges there that you faced, you know, and, and what would, what, you know, just to, 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 obviously there's someone watching this that may be in a similar situation. Talk a little bit about that, the challenges, the, the concerns that you have, some of the challenges that you still have yeah, in absolutely. trying to scale and grow it. Absolutely. So the one of the problems that, you know, issue is so, OK, so when I'm looking around for someone to look to, to talk to that looks like me in the industry, there's not many of us. Right. So there's not a lot of people that I can go find in the industry that were black that I could ask about how they started their own firm. Right. And yep. so now I find myself out on an island with no one to really kind of give me guidance. Mm -hmm. And so not that, and, and I don't want people to think like, I'm like, well, you can just ask other advisors just because they're not black. They don't, they, it's just different. Yeah, you know what yeah, I mean? I really yeah. can't, I really can't, you can't, sometimes you can't put into words how mm -hmm. different it is, mm -hmm. but it is different. Not, not from the, the standpoint of like, just, it, it's just different. And, and, and I'll say that, but that was one of the, the biggest challenges. And then like the way that it was like people were like oh you're starting your own firm i'm like yeah and they're like well who, you know what, what what does that mean right because <laughs> yeah. in my community they're like well, what does that mean what right. is that what, you know i'm yep. gonna come invest you know so i got questions like so i'm gonna invest my money with you you know i got ten thousand dollars i'm gonna give it to you where does the money go right like they don't even understand that right and i'm like well i'm gonna be with td ameritrade oh, okay td ameritrade so i have to go through this validation yeah. process yeah. even though i've been in the financial services industry for 18 years right i still have to go revalidate myself because now I'm no longer supported by this big company name. Right. And that's the same thing that I think other advisors go through. However, when you look out and you see the landscape of other advisors, there's a lot more of them. Mm -hmm. And so now you have this single black guy out here starting his own firm without the big company backing. Right. It's like, well, how does this work? Right. And so trying to explain through that was one of the, one of the challenges. However, I was very fortunate because I had the group of clients Right, right. <laughs> that looked like me, that trusted me. Right. Yeah. That said, you know, okay, I'm on, well, wherever you go, we're going. Right. And so yeah. that helped out a lot. So yeah. that was one of the things that was kind of like a like a silver lining in the trans transition. Mm -hmm. Because had I not had those group of people that that actually believed in me, I probably wouldn't have made it, man. Right, right. So because of your, you know, and one of the things, again, I, I've heard this, I'm sure you've heard it, you're serving that demo. It's where you got to change it up, right? You got to, are you forced to make any changes in terms of, again, who you custody with or your business model, right? How you actually charge them? Like, in, in, is it straight AUM or do you do like, do you do like some type of subscription or talk a little bit about that, how, how people actually work with you? Yes. So there's two ways that people work with me. Um, either you're going to have AUM mm -hmm. or three, actually. So you'll have AUM where, you know, 
you know how that works. Or we'll have financial planning mm -hmm. where we actually put together a plan and they can play that on a subscription. Now it's mm -hmm. an annual plan charged annually, mm -hmm. billed monthly, Bill monthly to make okay. it affordable for okay. people. Um, the other way is to have a combination of both right. where you will have a financial plan, mm -hmm. you will be charged for your investments, mm -hmm. and then we do, that would be a complete, complete comprehensive plan. Right. So those are the three ways that people work for me, work with me. Yeah. And, and I think that for now that was one of the toughest barriers that I had. Okay. Because we're talking to people that don't typically have financial plans. Right. Or we've been sold a financial plan from someone that's selling us a financial product. Product, yeah. Right? Yeah. And so yeah. at the end when I'm talking to people, that was pro now that I, now that I'm backing out of it, thinking yeah. about not back, but looking at what I just said, the toughest part is trying to explain to people why they're going to pay me monthly mm -hmm. to put together a plan for them. Mm -hmm that cost this much and why there's no product at the end of it. Right. Because we have done a horrible job in the financial services industry of selling products mm -hmm. and not giving solutions. Mm -hmm. So everybody was like, well, you're not, you don't sell life insurance. Mm -hmm. You don't sell annuities. I was like, no, I don't, I don't No, I don't sell that. Right. I'm going to make sure that you are on track financially. Well, what does that even mean? Right. <laughs> so yeah. now, you know, and that was one of the toughest things that right. I actually had to deal with. Now, now let's back up, right? Let's not take some things for granted because we do have the privilege of knowing what we know, but go back to AUM for a second and just explain that, okay. you know, so, so people understand. And again, you may have, you know, future yeah, clients watching absolutely. or whatever absolutely. the case may be. And, and again, we're speaking to, you know, uh, uh, again, be, be, being very sensitive to groups that we advocate for yes. and we, right, yes. we speak to, right? But just, just, again, if someone comes to you and I say, hey, Desarte, I want to work, I mean, you know, <laughs> <laughs> Evelyn, I want to work with you. Um, you know, what, what, what does that look like? Uh, or Desarte, um, what does that look like? You know, what is AUM? Yeah, so AUM is going to be assets under management. Um, the best way to explain that to people, especially people that, you know, may have, may have never worked with a financial advisor. Let's just say you were... Um, let's say you retired, right? Or you left the job. That, that's more, that's, yeah. that's a little more realistic or sooner. So you, you had a 401k at a job and you've been putting money away and now you, you know, you have a balance, 20,000, $40,000 and you leave mm -hmm. and you're like, what do I do with that balance? Well, someone like myself or Desarte <laughs> could manage that for you and we would charge you a percentage fee on right. the assets that we manage. Typically it's about 1% and so that 1% fee will come out of the assets that you've transferred over right. to take care of for us. And we will help you with picking the investments. Right. What I was finding is that's a big deal or a, a, a tough spot for people to be in because they don't know what they don't know. Right. Like they're like, I don't know why my account's going up and down. I don't understand this. And so what happens is when you have those assets, whether it's from a retirement plan or it's you know non-qualified, meaning it's not with a retirement plan, you can have someone like myself right. manage those assets and we charge you a percentage fee of the overall assets that we manage. So l let me ask you this, what, what do you feel like the industry could do better in terms of helping you, right? And, and and what I mean by that is, again, we can go so many ways what it means to be, you know, a black man in this business. But just in terms, again, we talk about diversity and inclusion and all of that. But you're, you're working with a particular group of people. We'll get into this as well, where relationship to you is really important. I know there's something I remember when we first met that you said or get to that. But where do you feel like the industry is lacking in providing you either the resources or the attention that you need in order for you to have a billion dollar RAA like you know some of our colleagues may have? I think the industry as a whole has to help educate minorities. And it's gonna have to come from other minorities. Yes. <laughs> so we have to have, I know we're trying to do diversity, we're trying to do inclusion, but it has to get more than, it has to be more than just a, a catchphrase or something to say. Thank you. Because it means, like it's one thing to say diversity and then I'm not. Even, I'm not gonna go. I'm not gonna say what I really want to say, yeah. just because I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. But right. but it, it's it, when we say diversity, it, it's it's become a buzzword and something fun to say. But until we have more Tyrones and more Imlins right. and more you know Keishas yeah. and more you know Marias and more other people of color in this industry to take this message back into their own communities, yep. we can't make a change. Like yep. we can't because. They're not gonna trust the Todds. Yep. Yep. I just yeah. it's just like if, if he shows up like and, and I and I said that name specifically because one of my close friends is named Todd and 
and we talked about this before. How can he reach people like, you know, he, he's a white guy. Right. And he says, how can I reach, you know, young black men like you? I said, Todd, you can't. Right. I said, you can come in and talk to us, but until we have more people that look like us in the industry, it's not going to change. One of the things I got a problem with is the conference prices. Let's just talk about it. Like, since you brought it up, yeah, we, let's listen, talk we about here, it. Like, we were looking at, we were looking at a conference the other day and like, you know, I, I love NAPFA, I love FPA, but when the conference cost twenty five hundred dollars and I'm just starting my firm. Right. That means I'm not going. Yep. And that means that some of the messages and some of the things that they have there that I need to hear, I'm not going to be able to hear in turn. I'm not going to be able to grow my firm in turn. I'm not going to be able to hire someone that looks like yep. me in turn. That's going to trickle down. Mm -hmm. So if you have something as small, it may seem something as insignificant as a conference fee, but a conference fee being at twenty five hundred bucks <laughs> makes it hard for me to get there. Yeah. Yep. And it makes it harder for me to have someone like if I do have a staff member, if I got to take them with me, that's five grand for me to take them. Yeah, that's not including the hotel the travel. Yeah. Yep. So like those are the kind of things that I think like we don't I don't want them to like think of it like as a, a welfare or like a handout or anything. But if you right. just lower the price in general, right, it would make it easier for people of color or advisors of color, especially new ones starting firms to be able to attend those conferences to get the nuggets that they need, because we still need other advisors that have been seasoned in this to learn from 100 percent but if we can't get as you the word you like to use is proximate, proximate if i can't yeah. go sit in the audience and listen to them yeah. and maybe be able to shake a hand and get a number and be able to meet with them later right yeah yeah no i and listen I, i'm with you on that and i'll go there on the diversity and inclusion yeah. thing right i've I, i've said it on my walk and talks and i'm tired of that term because what it started out as was for us yeah. in the 60s, yeah. Implitude, imp implemented in the 80s in companies, right? So people were comfortable working aside, working alongside black and brown folk. Mm -hmm. Now it's turned into, you know, a one-legged giraffe, mm -hmm. somebody that's under five foot, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and, and, and then it's, oh, well, we hired a woman, we're diverse, mm -hmm. right? away. So that has to change, and I, and I agree with that. And, and again, whether we, we, we call it representation and equity mm -hmm. or equality or whatever you want to do, but it's definitely become a trope. Mm -hmm. And it's not it, it doesn't hold any weight anymore because you can just you can just see that. So I agree with you. And one of the things that I said was I'm going to start doing is, yeah, I'll speak at your conference. Mm -hmm. But here's what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. You're going to reach out to Emily. You're going to reach out to DeSantis. You're going to reach out to Samuel. You're going to reach out to all these people. You're going to get them on board. And here's what I also said, right, is why not have a panel of all black male advisors? Have you ever seen one at any conference? No. And then, and then on top of that, I said, you're going to bust boys in, black boys in to hear me speak, mm -hmm. or at least attempt it, mm -hmm. because everyone else does it, right? Women are doing it. If they, I, want a, I want a woman panelist and, you know, the, the LGBTQ community. Why can't we do it? Because if we're going to have to fight for the changes that we want to see, which leads me, again, this is, a, this is a perfect part to this conversation is, again, access, exposure, proximity, all the things that I talk about, advocacy. Let's talk about that, right? And, and, you know, Altruist is a, is a company that's looking to disrupt the industry, make it cheaper for advisors to have to run their practice and work with people of all sorts. So d do you see technology as being a hurdle as well in terms of price or, you know, of, be, of being able to serve your clients? Because one of the things that I realize is I'm really big on tech, but I always have to humble myself and realize that as that starts to develop, it can get away from the people who really need it. Mm -hmm. It is making the industry more inclusive, mm -hmm but their access to it is limited mm -hmm. if the people who are giving them the advice mm -hmm. can't pay for it or don't have yeah. those tools. You know what I'm saying? Technology for me has actually been a, a, a really, really um, great spot for me. Right. And in, in, in being able to reach my clients and make it more accessible for yes. them and make it easier for them. Okay. However, now when I have some people, because everything is scheduling on an app, right? Okay. For my appointments. Right. There's no call, what time is this? What time are we going to meet? They do it all on the app. Mm -hmm. So from there, that's good. I do the rebalancing with with TD. I do every so that so technology for me has actually been it's been it's been oh, yeah, 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 I definitely don't want to make it and seem it's, and as it's if, not, no, no, I'm not saying yeah. you're saying that, but I'm yeah. saying it and I've been able to do it very inexpensive, right? Because of some of the people that I was able to meet to help me do stuff. So I mean, all in tech stack, real right. talk, like if I give you like real talk, my yeah. tech stack, like I'm paying less than 200 bucks for my tech stack wow. because I have a tamp 
right. that helps me with some of the stuff. And then I have my own text that I have, like my own little text stuff that I, so I've been able to do it on the cheap. Right. right. Yeah. Now, and, and again, you tend to give and voice your frustrations from where you sit, right? Yeah. So me playing in the crypto space, yeah. I'm completely aggravated yeah. that that tech is not going oh, to okay, the okay, people okay. who need it. You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? So yeah, yeah, from my perspective, right? And I get that. And that's right. And that, and again, that's why I love, again, this race to zero now in fees. Mm -hmm. And I love, I love the fact that you know, people can, again, I said our business has changed forever since 2007, mm -hmm. right? Where people could just do everything from their phone. But I think as we get to AI and we get more into crypto and all these other things, there is a, a, a group there that's, you can see already the chasm is growing between the accessibility to this technology and the resources that they have to actually get exposed to it. And I'm like, no, no, we got to catch this now, right? They still need exposure to that. I, I think about this, I think about my in-laws. So my, uh, my mother-in-law doesn't speak English. My father-in-law, he's, he's, he's pretty good. Yeah. And I think about, when I think about technology, would I be able to send them the link? Would I be able to, would yeah. they be able to understand? I don't know. Right. You know, um, there's a, there's, I heard you talk about unbanked and that yeah. really rings a bell with me because well, my wife's a bank manager and I used to be a bank manager. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so yeah, there's yeah. a, the group of people that are unbanked mm -hmm. are only going to get further away. Yes. As technology. Yes. So, so I get what you're yep. saying with that. Yep. Cause they're not going to, they just don't trust technology. Yep. And then people aren't communicating that like, it, it's it's funny to see it because I see like, uh, and this is just straight from banking. I see my wife's frustration with people that she's like, people still come into the bank and ask for their balance. She's like, we got apps, they got yeah. they got online, right. they can access it from the ATM, mm -hmm. but they're not comfortable with that. Yep, they're not. And so, how do we help those people? And that's a that's a tough question. Right. right. Like and that's... and and the thing is, when you say those people, you're talking about my parents, yeah. right? Like I literally had to I had to open up a TD statement yeah. and walk my parents through it, like the debits, the credits, right? They don't trust, right? No apps or anything. Like it's all paper. So that part. So I'm always cognizant of that, right? I, I love technology. I love what it's doing. And listen. We have tremendous privilege, and I know I don't I don't live a life anywhere near what my parents do. But I mean, I hate going to the ATM. I ain't doing any of that. But so, so yeah, we definitely have to be be aware of that, especially as we're trying to be a voice for the communities that we serve. Is that they can be left behind. The, the whole cashless thing, right? That's a that's a whole another thing, right? There's just people who continue to use. My father loves cash. That's like all he's ever known, right? Like if he can't hold it in his hand, it's not real to him. Yep. You know, um, he'll never swipe a card. He'll never do any of that. Like he needs cash in his hand. So it, it, it's really interesting when you really start to get into the weeds of who we serve and why we serve. And like you said, what I love the fact that you mentioned it makes it easier. And also, let me ask you this. Does it make you the the the, the cost is great, right? Because it, it's not it's inexpensive, but does it allow you to take on more people, right? Which is right. I'm it allows sure me to take on more people, and it adds a legitimacy to the business. Yep. When they're like, "Oh, I don't have here. Use this app." Right. Oh, wow, well, I can just and I ask them when they come in, "How easy was? It? Oh, it was right. easy." And it sent me a reminder before. So now they're like, "Oh, wow, well, he he really has a business." Right. This right. isn't just Emlyn. Just like I'm 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 not helping Emlyn out. Right, 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 right. He's helping me. Yeah. And so it's, you know, it's that. It's some of the questionnaires that they have. After they set up the appointment, it automatically has a pre-meeting questionnaire that it goes to. They're like, oh, wow, I went straight to the question. So they come in and they, and they embrace the technology. Now, there's a difference between that person and the person that's not going to know how to use a computer because yeah. I have people like that, too. Right. But they trust me because they, they, they know me. Yeah. Right? And they yeah. can say, okay, well, at least... At least he looks like me or, you know, his wife looks like me so I can kind of trust him a little yeah. bit. And so I can get past some of that just because they trust me. But if like once again, if we don't have more of us and when I say us, I mean black and brown people in the workspace, the level of trust continues to drop. Yeah, absolutely. And so so let's go there for a minute. Right. Because you said uh, you, you referenced. Right. You said they trust me. They trust me. So who is me? Right. Who are you? Like, why, why is it that? And I and again, I, I, I go, always go back to when, you know, we first met, which wasn't too long ago, which yeah. is fascinating about all of this is that, you know, when we were doing the whole round table with Justin and, you know, that we recorded, you were saying that, you know, how your clients literally they invite you over and you get invites to stuff or whatever. And you could tell you were really big on the relationships mm -hmm. you have with your clients. Where does that come from about you and your constitution that makes you up that that's so important to you? comes from my grandmother um you know my grandmother uh my grandmother passed away a few years back but my grandmother was big on relationships i knew all of my cousins and everything like that because every weekend we're in the car 
going to see family, hanging out. Not only family, but she had her friends. We'd go to their house, and we'd always sit down. We'd talk. We'd break bread, and there was, like, I don't think... This is this is that's what we that's what we eat together. I don't think you're really friends with someone until you go eat in their house and sit down at their table and eat with them. You yeah. can't call that a friend yeah. unless you don't do. Yeah, that. you gotta break bread. And so when I started my firm and even before, the thing that I would say to my clients is, and I, I said this, you've heard me say it before, but I, I said, if you're going to Thanksgiving dinner and everyone at the table doesn't know who I am, then I didn't do a good job. Wow. Because when you're sitting at Thanksgiving dinner, that's when you're talking about, you know, everybody, the family's together, everybody's talking about everything. And, right. and so this is where I want to position myself in my client's life as a right. part of their family is something they discuss at the table. Right. And so that's where the, the genesis of that came from my grandmother, like going around, making sure people, you know, my grandma's taking people food, cooking cakes, yeah. you know, taking pies over here, doing all that stuff. And so it just really was important for me to be able to build those relationships before I can talk to you about your money, before I can talk to you about saving this retirement, putting the kids to school. I got to know something about you. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I think we as an industry have done a good job about getting the numbers right and getting the people wrong. Oh, and so that's if, free jewelry. People. If, if we don't, if we don't get the people right, yeah, the numbers don't matter. Right. And I, and I love that, too, because I'm very big on family, too. And I was just on my walk and talk last night. I was talking about we need to get back to breaking bread. That means something. And my mother raised us like that. Somebody puts food in your mouth. Mm -hmm. You're supposed to honor that person. Mm -hmm. Just honor them as a person. Not, you know, you got to go out of your way. But you always respect the fact that that person did that because they don't have to. And breaking bread is always sacred. I mean, we were raised that you don't throw bread out. You wet it. Like, that's how sacred it was in our house. You would wet the bread before you, you threw it out. And, and if my mother was there, she'd probably, oh, my father, would make you cut out the cut mold, the mold part like, and you're going to toast that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> cut the mold off. Like, and that, that's yeah. like, like it, it, it became a place, like, and, and my friends that, 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 uh, that grew up with me, like, my house was the place where you, like, everyone knew when my grandma was cooking. Yep. Like you come over, grandma's yep. cooking. She like, hey, you, they're like Sunday is Sunday. We, you know, Sunday dinner. Yeah. It's gonna be like that. And and I think that that's like the times when the advisors would come. I remember the insurance man coming to the house. He sit down at the table with us. Yep. Like if we're eating dinner, insurance man come down, sit mm -hmm. at the table and eat with us. Right. It's just, I mean, I think we missed that. Right. So it comes from, you know, comes from your, you know, your, your grandmother, and obviously you're very big on family now. Anyone that follows you on social media, you can see like. You, 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 the importance of family to you, and a lot of advisors have been doing that, but talk about that, right? You, you know, you, you put the shirt on and what you're saying about, about the shirt, but talk a little bit about your family and the role your family plays in how you service your clients, right? And, and how you look at, again, tying all that together, your grandmother to your personal experiences, to your practice. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to family, like it, it was, it's crazy. So I'm just, gonna, I'm just gonna jump in. Like families, like my grandmother's always been like the the held the family together mm -hmm. like so i have my my grandfather my grandmother my mom and and she held everything together and like i remember growing up and 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 i'm just gonna keep it 100 with yeah. you like growing up and going to visit my uncles and my mom in prison like with my grandma that was part of the stops right like we go over here, eat dinner, do that, do this. Then we go see my mom when she was, you know, when she wasn't doing well. We go see my uncle, come back, and it just always, like, it it just really kind of made family important. It didn't matter what you did. Yep. yep. <laughs> and it's kind of crazy, right? Like yep. it didn't matter what you did. Like this was family. We got to take care of them. And so now, like, you know, being married, um, this is my this 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 is my second marriage. A lot of people don't know that. Yeah. So it's my second marriage, and, and being married and, and seeing like how my wife is with her family. They're so tight. Mm -hmm. Like they got group texts. They talk all the time. And so having that plus what what I've had with my my own grandmother, and then trying to like make this family. Like I'm, I'm wearing this shirt today. My uncle bought me this shirt, and right. it's the original. Um, because my son is the encore. Right. You know, he, he's uh, Emlyn Miles Mattingly the second. And so, like, just having all of that stuff, like, like, if my clients call me because I post something on social media about my son, like, they don't even talk business, like, they don't even right, ask, right, they, right, because the numbers aren't that important. Yep. They call to ask about, hey, how's how's the baby? How's he doing? What's right. going on with him? You know, how's you know this and that? And I think that that, like, we went. I had my, I had my, uh, and I hope I'm answering the question right, yeah, but no, I listen. had my. Um, 
my uh, my client um, appreciation dinner last year. Yep. Right. So we had the appreciation dinner, and one of my business partners he came in, and he was like, "Man, Emlyn, everybody in this room knows each other." I was like, mm-hmm. "Yeah," I said, "Because most of them are related." Yeah. And he was like, "He said you better not ever make anybody mad." I was like, "You damn right, I can't make anybody <laughs> mad because I, you know." But but that was that's the atmosphere that we have. Like everyone knows each other. When we talk about Gen Next Wealth, is Gen Next. Wealth is helping minority families build generational wealth. So I need to know mom and dad. I need to know the kids that are my age. I need to know the grandkids. The money is all lined up there. Yeah. I'm not even spending much time talking about the money because I'm talking about, you know, what grandbaby was born and mm-hmm. how old, you know, what kid is going to this school and kids are getting ready to go to college and all this stuff that's going on. And, right. and that's what's important because that's. And, and, and this is what I love about. Honestly, and, I, and, I, and I'm super biased because this is no doubt the best podcast in the universe. But this is what I love about this podcast is that, right, you, you can see someone's practice, right? We make it very visual, wh- who we serve, right? And, the, you know, it's crypto, it's retirement planning, it's whatever. But what I love in, in, in all of these conversations is if you follow it back, mm-hmm. Right. Mine, mine goes back to my parents. Right. You mentioned your grandmother. Right. Other folks have mentioned their their father or whatever. Your practice is always a a menagerie, so to speak, of the people in your life. Right. And you created family out of your your clients because family's big to you. Right. From your personal, you know, your immediate family to your extended family. And I think we bring a lot of that. We bring more to our practice than what we think. And that's what, uh, you know, again, I can never mention by name, but my mentor was like, what you're going to realize when you start to become a successful advisor. And and I want to stop using the term book, but he was like, your book is going to look a lot like you. And he said, and not in the ways that you think. Right. Is that a lot of the things that are important to you will be important to them. A lot of the things that they dislike, you'll dislike, right? It's, it'll really start to blend. And it's amazing to see, you know, to, to, to see that and how you talk about it. And when you said that, again, so many people said so many powerful things in that room. Shout to Courtney as well. Um, but when you said that, I'm like, man, that's so true. Because I, it, it's like that with me, too. I feel like my clients, it, it, I almost feel like it's, it's nasty to use that word. With them. Like, we're friends. Like, they, they literally call when they see some on social media may not be right you okay you good is there anything that we can do you know um they've been so supportive of this right so it's like you think about how those relationships start and they grow with you the kids get older all of that stuff and then now you're at the point where you're like man it's almost like they're family and they know each other right your your friends become some of their friends some of your colleagues or whatever so it's it's amazing how again humanizing this business at the end of the say, at the end of the day like you said the numbers could be right that's fantastic right but you're just missing the people everything is doing this so that's incredible and and and, and again before we get too far away from this I, I definitely want to stay in this vein because one of the things that is so important when I meet people and talking to them and me being in the transition of my life now where I'm, I'm healing, I'm finding a second life. Like, I, I, it's, it's, it's weird. Like, every day for me is kind of an out-of-body experience because I don't, I'm not supposed to be here for a lot of reasons. I saw it being differently and, again, just in, in you know, a, a moment of weakness, you know, I almost gave it all up. But I definitely want to hit on 2012, right? And we had a, a really deep conversation. We didn't know each other probably literally five minutes, yeah. right? And, and we were talking about that, but just just talk a little bit about not and, and, and again, the details aren't for everybody, yeah, 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 but just about how that makes you you right and, and what that because I believe adversity reveals. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. The good and the bad, but just talk a little bit about that. And that was so and it's so funny. You were just talking about the experience. We just had so happened to match the year at the mm-hmm, end. Mm-hmm. But but talk a little about that and how that experience made, made you you and, and who you are today. Yeah. So 2012. Hell of a year. So um, things happen at the bank. I end up leaving from the bank. And this is right after, you know, get a divorce, leave a job. Uh, don't really know what's going on. My, 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 um, my grandfather had passed away a few years before. My uncle had passed away a few years before. Uh, just, a, just, a, just, a, just a tough year. And I remember, I think I told you this when we were sitting there. So I remember sitting there on my bed, you know, this is seven years ago now, sitting there on my bed, tears running down my face, not knowing what I was going to do. I just started at one company. I was working at Edward Jones, getting ready to go um, work somewhere else at principal. 
and just in the valley of despair, if you will, just sitting there. And I said, man, I don't know what I'm going to do. And tears running down my face. And I said, you know what? And, and I remembered, I remembered, uh, it was a Bible verse. I can't remember the exact verse, but I remember it said, David encouraged himself in the Lord. Mm -hmm. And I sat there and I said, and literally heard a voice say, everything's going to be all right. Everything's going to be all right. Everything's going to be all right. And I, and I remember that, saying that over and over with everything's going to be all right. Started that principle after that, 2013 hit. Set the record for having the most applications taken there. So 2012 right. ended. It was just right. bad. I was like, get right. this year over with. Right. 2013 came. I started working at principal. I set the record for having the most applications ever taken. I started to build my practice. I hired my first employee that second year when I came in. And things just started to, to move forward from there. But there was some some real adversity that I faced in without getting into the details, yeah, yeah, but yeah. there was some adversity that I had in, in 2012 that, that, uh, that, that I felt was like rock bottom, almost lost my house, um, had the, you know, had the, 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 the failed marriage career ultimate, just, I wanted to get into financial planning, just not our financial advising, just not the way that I was kind of pushed into it. Right. But, I really believe everything everything worked out, man. Cause, cause I, I don't think that you can ever experience high highs if you haven't had low lows. Right. Yeah. Again, it, it it's in uh it's incredible to think, right? And and you know, <laughs> I'm not even going to start on that. But so yeah. I look back now, it's like 2012 was so bad, which is by far it was the year of my life. But 2007 was awful. Mm -hmm. But it was like 2012 was just so bad. Like it it, it was. Uh, uh, it was it was again it was a breaking point for me where it's like that moment as you said you're saying like everything was going to be all right and it's like this moment literally the podcast you being here like this was birthed out of what I went through there like literally at that moment because all of that was on the way and I kind of got snatched back for this moment right as as and you you know you talk about a bible bible verse right for such a time as this right is a, is a is a really a really powerful thing, man, but I, I definitely wanted to touch on that. And, and before we go from there, two Bible verses, but let's talk about that, right? That, you know, being, being a pastor and, and yeah, that, yeah. that part of, I don't know how much of, it, how much of that oh, you no, bring no, to your, no, well, no, I don't know how much of that you bring to your practice, but let's talk about that. Oh, you'd I mean, be surprised, man. Yeah. You'd be surprised. So, yeah, so uh, back in like 2000, uh, I want to say it was 2000, I was working at, so about 2007. Um, I was assistant pastor at a small church in Chachilla, which is a, a, a city about 15. It's in the county of Madera. Okay. So I was there and uh, yeah, man, I went to Bible college for four years, um, studied theology. It was, it was, it was, it, I mean, I was, you know, live, breathe, eat, sleep, right. preach every, you know, preach on Sunday, Wednesday, do the new converts class, all that stuff. Right. And that, like, I think that your life not just life in general, like everything that happens prepares you for what's going to happen next. Yeah. Me being able to have conversations with people at church about their lives, right. yeah. <laughs> giving them guidance in their right, life, right, right, right. Um, preaching messages, getting sermons, getting all that stuff, prepare me to be able to do public speaking, prepare me to be able to deal with tough family situations when I'm talking to someone in, in, a, in, wow. a, in, in a position like that. And then being able to give them some guidance. Like, I was doing that. But I was, like, 25 years old. Wow. So here I am going to the hospital to go pray for someone, not knowing what's going to happen, but just believing by faith. I remember one time I asked my, my pastor, like, he was uh, uh, just, a, like, the, my, my mentor used to tell me, he said, man, he said, you have that barbarian faith. This is what he used right, to tell right, me. He, right, just right. Called, he's, he said, you said, the Bible says that it's going to do it, and you just believe it. Right. So one time my pastor's back was hurt, and I was like, well, you want me to pray for you? You believe God can heal it? He was like, bro, I'm the pastor. What are right, you right. asking? I was like, I just asked you the question. You believe what the Bible says. So right. I just think that those types of, like, um, like life experiences to be able to draw from those and being able to see how I use it now in my practice and dealing with people. I'm not very judgmental. Um, Are you I'm shy with bringing religion into your practice? Oh, God, no. Mention, is, is you open no, with no, it? no okay. not at all. I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I don't call it religion. I call it right. relationship, right? Okay. Because I think that it's, it's different. Like there's, there's certain things that you don't do because of how close your relationship is with your mom or yeah. with your dad. Mm -hmm. And so you liken it to relationship. Religion causes a lot of problems. It does. It so does. I'm very, very cognizant about how I bring it up 
And then sometimes people don't even realize I'm using biblical principles when I talk to them. Right. They just don't, you know, they don't yeah. know. They just understand that, that this is the principle. So um, it's, it's one of those things that, that, that I'm, I'm glad that I was able to do that. And, and, and once again, that was my grandmother because she would make go. me go to church. Right. Like, whether I wanted to go or not. So. All right. Well, I know what my mother's favorite podcast episode is going to be, yeah. this one. Um, by the time you work some church into one of them episodes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah man. So uh, here we go. Um, I ask everybody this question. And, and again, part of the genesis of the question when, you know, we were developing the podcast or whatever, it's easy to ask somebody, what are you grateful for? Right. But as someone who's in the healing process of, of, of getting to the point of, and I've had some incredible answers and I want to be able to answer this question at some point with some confidence and some pride um, to demonstrate healing to myself. But I, I want to ask you, you know, what, what are you most grateful for that never worked out for you? <laughs> it, it's going to be interesting because it's one of the things that I always think about, but I am grateful that I never was able to really play college football. Wow. And it's, and it's like, I think about that. Like I had, um, uh, an opportunity to try out at, Fres at uh, San Jose State. I played a little bit at uh, a junior college and it seemed like everything was against me to try to play football. Like I love, to this day, I still love football. But I think that had I made it in football, I would not be helping as many people as I'm being able to help now. <laughs> and I wouldn't be able to, you know, I probably wouldn't have met my wife. I, you know, no telling where all that would have went. But I think that was that was the best thing that ever happened. I love the game, love the sport. Um, you know, hopefully my son wants to play if he wants to, if he does right. play, but, but I think that that was probably it, not being able to play collegiate football. Wow. And, and again, that, that's powerful. We'll, we'll leave it there. But again, as, as, I, as I did say, you know, to Desarte, when he answers kind of saying that right with us, us all being athletes and that whole thing is that I'm not there, right, to be able to say that. And you know a little bit of my story, but I wish at some point Right. For myself. And I pray for myself that I'm just able to be like, man, I'm so glad the Olympics never worked out. Now, again, some of the things that are happening, mm -hmm. realize that there's some there's some things that I'm doing now I would have never done then. But that that's a very powerful answer, man. And thank you for me. And I'm sure thank you from everybody else for your time. Um, thank you guys for tuning in to another episode. This is this has been real uh, and, and deep. Appreciate you. See you on the next one.